Say, say, kids, what time is it? PDR Tool 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 Time. What's up, guys? Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is uh, John Hiley with your other host here of PDR Tool Time. And as you heard here, we got Daniel Grom back I'm, for this back. Uh, yeah, for this episode. And we got Vince D'Alessandro here. And Mike is still off in a foreign country. Yes, he uh, is. I don't the even, European vacation. I don't even know where he's at now, but he did say that he has been doing nothing but eating and he looks like a sausage. Well, yeah, I heard that. And uh, also, I think he might not make it back into the country. There's a weight limit on the planes. And I think he might have <laughs> the weight limit coming back. <laughs> you know, I told him when he comes back, we're going to be like, where's Mike? You ate Mike. Mike, are you in there, buddy? This big <laughs> fat guy ate you. <laughs> it's all them carbs, guys. It's all them carbs, man. I'm telling you. Yeah, I was literally just looking at the pictures that he posted from Venice, Italy, and uh, he's eating. He's eating his way through Italy right now. <laughs> <laughs> An Italian food tour, man. That's nothing but carbs. Absolutely. Ugh. Yeah, but those people never get fat. How come? Wine. Lots of wine. Oh, maybe they know how to control themselves. <laughs> they do. I, I can wine and uh, olive oil too. You know. That's uh, yeah. If I start going to town on some Italian pizza, man, I can't control myself. It's over. You know, it's hands down. I'm, I'm yeah. gonna lay down. I'm gonna feel like I just passed out from a food coma, and then I'm gonna lay there and 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 have like sugar rushes go through my whole body. <laughs> that shit turns into sugar. That's what uh, carbs do. Oh, yeah. Sure. Oh yeah, I live with the type one diabetic. Actually, Daniel does too, and that's it's all about the carbs and sugar. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. And, right. And in fact, I just got my uh, health results back, and they were not good. My cholesterol is too high. My wife gave me some awful crap that I had to drink this morning, and uh, man, did that clean me out. <laughs> what what color was it? it? It looked like tea. And it tasted like, um, I don't even know what it tasted like. It didn't taste like anything from this earth. Let's put it that way. It was man, not good. I can't even believe you go to one of them guys, man. A, a doctor? doctor? You go to a doctor? <laughs> <laughs> I had to do it for my uh, life insurance. Oh, the, see, that's yeah. my secret of staying so healthy. I just never go to doctors. Yeah, well, but you have to get tested if you have life insurance. Well, yeah, dude, that might not be a good thing, man. You no, might not no, want that no. submitted. <laughs> uh, threw my rates up. I yeah. can't afford it. I got to make more money. Well, you know, speaking of that, I mean, I got like a million bucks of life insurance. I was told that was uh, essentially enough um, at this time. But uh, yeah, I mean, I got tested early on for that, that stuff uh, when I was uh, healthier. Yeah, well, it's gonna come up again, John. I, I got to do it here in the next, uh, I think, year or two. I'm 42 now, and and they reevaluate you in the early 40s. Yep, gets worse and worse, man. Ouch! Buy all you can and, and get it as for as long as you can, so you don't have to do that as that as often. Right, right. So let, let's tell everybody, uh, you know, what we're gonna be talking about today. We are gonna be talking about our money maker. And not Daniel's money maker because he knows he's he's out there shaking his money maker, yeah. but uh, you know he's out there. <laughs> but we're talking about money making tools, and we, we're going to talk a little bit about the evolution of these tools. And throughout our career, you know some of the uh, some of the milestones that we looked at something and we said, "Wow, I mean this thing changes how much money I make." It makes me quicker. It makes my job come out better. Or or even that, you know, there's some tools that came along that now we're repairing dents that we wouldn't have repaired in the past. And um, so anyhow, you want to crack into this, Daniel? I know who, who's been doing PDR the longest between you and Vince. 93. And I'm 95. So right. he's got a couple years on me. Right. So I've been doing it the least amount of time. 
Um, but so, so let's go ahead and let's well, let back, Daniel. Well, back then there was, there just wasn't any tools available and just having, uh, some variety of tools was the biggest thing, you know, just, you know, we're, I was constantly out there in the search, um, for new tools because I kept on coming across problems, uh, of not being able to get to a dent. And I'm like, okay, there's gotta be a better way. Um, cause back then there wasn't any shave tools. There wasn't any whale tails. There wasn't there, you know, uh, th there's very few hand tools. Right. Um, uh, back then. Well, uh, in 95, we had whale tails at Dent Wizard. Yeah. I was going to say, when did the whale tail appear? Because that's a money. 1995. Well, uh, yeah. even Dent Wizard made their own, but, uh, uh, who's the guy from Florida that made those tools? It's not not around anymore. Uh, Inventure Inventure had whale tails in '95. Yeah, all that came around 1995. Okay, so you know '93 there was A1 and Specific Innovations. '94 uh, Inventure came in, I think, if I remember right. Now, Daniel, yeah, how was you getting under the brace before the uh, whale tail came along? Um, but, you know, back then, the, the cars were, they were kind of like... But they're the horrible. <laughs> they were corrugated uh, braces. Yeah. And you drill to get inside the brace. So <laughs> you look where the spot welds were. Yeah. And you would be like, okay, if I drill right here, I'll be inside the brace. And you had just like a, a little hockey stick. Yeah. And that was, that was it. I had um, one window shave tool, um, you know, slow J hook. Um, but there just, there just wasn't a variety. And then um, that's when I started going to, started to go to NACE, which was the big auto body show. And that's where the tool guys were going at the time. That's where I met Tom Price. And, and guys were starting to make stuff. And I, that's when I was getting involved in designing tools. Hey, we need a tool to do this. We need a tool to do that. And what I was doing, um, and I still do this. I'll, I take a coat hanger and I yeah. stretch it out. And I bend it into the door. And if I can take off the door panel even better... And I'll bend that, I'll slip that down through the window and I'll bend that, that coat hanger to the shape I want it to get where I want it to be and then pull it out and there's my template. And I, I would send that off to the tool guy and he would be able to make a tool from that. It was way better than a drawing. He would get all the angles and everything and it worked great for designing a tool. Now, Daniel, uh, do you remember A1 had... Now that I'm thinking about it, it might have been one of the first shave tools I've ever seen. Was A1 had the pistol grip, the black pistol grip, and that was that was like a what an eighth inch tool. Yeah, it, it was shaved. It was actually yeah. Shaved. I think that came out like it had a couple bends on it. It was like a double bend. Yeah, oh. that was like '94, I think. Mm -hmm. And that that handle was from uh, the tire industry. Yes, for like the fixing a flat tire, it was kind yeah. of the same. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. So, so essentially, um, some of the first few tools that at that time became money makers. We're talking about a whale tail because now you can just slip into the door, get in, and get out. And then shave tools obviously became money maker because you're going into upper door braces. And yep. essentially, some shave tools can be used quite versatile, like a whale tail. You know, if they're thin enough and they're bendable, I've got one. Um, I'm going to tell you guys it's number 32, uh, shave tool adjustable handle from PDR Finesse that I can't live without now. It's a bendable whale tail that's a shave tool, essentially. You can go through the bottom of uh, the Porsche doors, the little plugs, the BMW doors, go straight up underneath the, the braces on them 911s. But you can't find it in their shave tool section. you got to punch in the number 32. And I've told them time and time again, fix it, you know. So, uh <laughs> <laughs> but you literally, I don't think they have uh, much control over their website. So go you in there what? and punch I 32. I got to order that, John, because I'm ashamed to say that I don't, I don't have one shave tool. Not one shave tool. Yeah, yeah, you, you got to get a hold of. If I was to get any shave tool, that one is the game changer for me. And Gene Fetty just, um, 
I guess I talked about it on another show, and Gene actually just texted me today, and he was like, what's the number of that tool? And I remember, and I took a photo of it, and I showed it to him. But yeah, It's number 32. Uh, who makes it? Uh, PDR, PDR Finesse. Finesse. And yeah, um, yeah. I'm sure it is. I'll look on here, and I might change that. But while, while we're talking here, I'll actually look on their website and make sure that's the case. So, Okay, cool. Now, Daniel, I don't know about you, but back back in the 90s, I wasn't fixing big dents. I wasn't fixing big dents like we do today. Uh, I think the, the composition of cars have changed throughout the years that have allowed us to, to uh, fix bigger dents without issues and, and you know cleaner repairs with, with it. And along with, with the evolution of tools, I think the evolution of the galvanized steel on, on the vehicles and access through braces or lack of braces has really been a game changer for us too. Is that, in the 90s, I was not fixing big pans. If I did, I, like if I had a quarter panel, crushed in quarter panel, I would get in the trunk of that car, take my sho- shoes off, and use the ball or the heel of my, my oh, foot yeah. to, to push it a quarter panel out before I ever put a tool on it. Oh, yeah, I did that. <laughs> I can't but, remember the last time I had to do that. Yeah, you, you have to understand, I, I opened up my, my shop in 94. I only I was only doing dents for a year before and then I decided I'm I'm going retail. I I knew right from the get go I wanted to have a shop. And so I opened up my shop in ninety four and um there wasn't a lot of business back then. <laughs> People didn't know what PDR was and fortunately my rent was low enough, but I made I was making my money and staying alive doing training. So I started doing training and manufacturing tools and i ended up getting a client from uh japan and japan's economy was really strong back then and uh, i was selling tools to this guy over in japan so all that was funding me keeping the shop open and if a customer came in it was rare that i said no i mean i was saying yes to anything just to stay alive and and I would tell them, I'll, I'll give it a try. Don't know. And there's a lot of times I couldn't fix it. And we'd tell them, sorry, no charge. Here's the car back. Um, but I learned a ton going through that. I mean, I was, I was doing stuff back then that nobody thought could be possible. And, um, and then I started developing tools for, you know, the bigger stuff. And the big Big change came when we started getting uh, uh, removal tips. You know, going going forward, removal tips was the next big game game changer, in my opinion. Yeah. Right, right. Well, hey guys, we, uh, go ahead, Jeff. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm that it is the uh, thirty-two, and it's a twenty-three inch long, one fourth diameter shave tool. Uh, it's got a forty degree flag with an adjustable handle. This thing is money, and you guys, you know what? Thank me later after you buy it, because it's uh, and like I said, you can't find it in their shave section. You got to punch thirty-two in the search box. There'll be some whale tails that come up, but you'll find the tool. Hey, uh, John, uh, copy that link and send it over on the side there. Oh yeah, we'll yeah. do. We'll do on the chat. Uh, now, J- John or 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 Daniel, we some of our smaller tools that I used to make back in the day too was. <laughs> I worked at the auction, the Chicago Auto Auction in ADT in, in Mannheim, and we used to take antennas off of cars to make little tiny tools out of it. And we'd hit the metal from an antenna is fantastic to make tools. Yeah, that and the 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 spring from a a trunk. Oh yes, <laughs> you ever take the spring out? There's a, a a tension spring or whatever you call it, um, big rod in the trunks. And you'd rip those out, and that was spring steel. That was good stuff. Yeah, and that was at least uh, what a quarter inch or bigger. Yeah, yeah. You know, when I first met Michael Meggs, uh, he told me he said that that's what they used to, you know, make their tools out of, and they'd go to the junkyard. But they said you never want to tell the junkyard guy that it was for making a tool, or else they'd charge you an arm and a leg for it. <laughs> He said you had to go in there and tell him that your your grandpa makes little yard signs and you cut them down and he makes some little wooden yard signs, you know? And uh, that's how they would g- actually go in there and get a hold of them without the junkyard to just be like, oh, I'll take as many as you want, you know? <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. 
Now, John, is that tool bendable at all or no? It's it that's is just a great uh, shaft. On, dude, shaft you on you it. the coolest thing you can bend it and snake it into any position, and it's okay. like rock solid hmm. bushing. So, like awesome. you know, the Porsche nine elevens, how hard they are to get in that upper door brace because of that giant yeah. curve. Well, this is small enough to go through the hole in the bottom, and you can curve it and bend it to fit r- slip right underneath that brace. It's nice, unbelievable. And then, okay, so you know the little hole that you adjust the door handle on cars. Yeah. Well, if you got a dent up above that, underneath that bracing, this thing bends and slips right in there like a whale tail from the top of that hole, which gotcha. you can't fit a whale tail through it. The holes are usually too small. That is like having a bendable whale tail that's a freaking strong tool. Um, you guys will thank me day in and day out for that tool. All right, my cheap ass is going to go ahead and buy that. So that's good. <laughs> you better hurry up. You better do it before the podcast release. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's an advantage that we have. We have a few days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyhow, we just went through the kind of, we're going into whale tails, you know, came out, and then some shave tools came out, and then we're talking about the uh, the tip tools, you know, and the soft tips that you can, uh, uh, what, what would you just talk about, the exchangeable tip tools? Yeah, th- just having a soft tip was a, a big game changer, in my opinion, for me anyway, for doing bigger stuff. Um, and I was always in search of tools that would work on bigger stuff. I, I also briefly, I, I had a salesman come into my shop in 1995 and he was selling this, it had a pistol grip and it had a suction cup on it and it had a button on it. Um, so you'd be able to push it onto a car and pull out a dent. And then you'd push the button to, to release the air. And this guy had made it for something else. And he brought it into me. And I said, I love it. And I started selling them. I, I sold a lot of them back then. And so I was taking those big dents that, that right now would use Cola Free on. Yeah. And um, that was like the first handheld suction cup. And then. Um, I, then I discovered wood and I got some, I ran into a, a glass guy and he had one of those wood suction cups and I ended up calling that company. You know, this is the beginning of the internet back then. So you didn't have all these resources that you have now. Yeah. And uh, I ended up getting a wood suction cup with a handle on it for doing big dents. And that was, that was big for me, man. I remember that. Well, and you know what? That's a game changer too, because prior to the wood suction cups, I think they came on the market for us. Mm-hmm. We started getting them about 97. But prior to that, we were using a magnet base. And yeah. we would the magnet base with the lock line with our reflection boards. And we would have to tie, we would tie a, a rag around the bottom of the suction, or I'm sorry, the, the magnet base so we wouldn't scratch the cars. Yeah. And, uh, we inevitably we would scratch cars you know because you get yeah you get shavings on it or whatever you know you get little metal pieces yeah right so definitely that woods cup did change the industry with with reflection boards by all means right big big changer there you know a lot of people don't probably thought that they were always around they weren't you know daniel you're talking about the woods cup i remember i used to have a suction cup that had a O-ring that came off of it. And do you guys remember that, that hung down the hood? You can suction at the top of the hood, and it had like an O-ring that came off of it that you could push off of, kind of like how you can push off of a gutter oh, yeah, hook yeah, yeah. on the oh, hood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Every now and again, that sucker, I started using it to pull dents, like you're talking about. I just grab the, oh, yeah. the rope that's on it and pull on it and pull the dents. But cause, because every now and again, when you were pushing dents on a hood, you'd get into the zone, and the thing would pop off and smack you right in the head. Oh, sure. <laughs> like it was straight up dangerous, man. Yeah. And but uh, I, I used to take that, that, that hook that came off of it and I'd use a ratchet rope and I'd ratchet to a fence post or something to keep tension on it while I was knocking down my crown. Right. Yeah, that, that off-dolly technique's awesome. You know, a lot of times people nowadays use the T-handles to do that and they just put a glue tab on it. And hold yeah. it from the outside, or you know, we, you know. Here's the thing, and here's what I want to progress into, and I'm going to tell everybody this right now because we didn't say it at the beginning, but we're saving for our tech tip, our number one tool. So we all know what our number one tool is at the very end of the show, but we're saving that for our tech tip for you, and uh, so you guys are going to have to wait to hear that. 
But, um, you know, going into, uh, you know, what we're talking about here is, uh, what, what were we just going into, Daniel? What were you, what were you just going into? Well, uh, talking about suction cups, um, and, you know, looking for stuff for big dents, but the, but the next big thing was lights. So we were using at the, at the beginning, we were using just off the shelf, uh, light fixtures. And I, I learned with this big, huge, heavy steel light and with a, a four foot fixture on it. Right. But the bulbs, and I used to haul that thing around in the back of my car and haul that thing out every time, run a, an extension cord. I mean, guys would just laugh now. Um, and, uh, you know, hauling that thing in and out of the car, the bulbs would break they would get loose i mean it was a constant you're always you i would i would glue all the joints in it so it would stay together i had tape all over this thing i did everything i could to keep that light together and um and then you'd be in i'd be in big trouble when there was you know a bulb would break and i'd be like you know 30 miles for the nearest hardware store or whatever i've been there daniel i've been there as well man right yeah, right. hey, I still have my light. Like, I still have my original light, which is just the metal stand with the uh, V base, you know. And the very first one that I had was just like the fluorescent lights that you see up in the ceiling. But the little center part that was in the middle, we painted it green. So essentially, it was a, a fluorescent light with a green stripe in the middle. And nice. the biggest problem with that is you can see straight lines, but you can't really see a gradual fog. <laughs> You know what I mean? And it it just kind of makes you wonder, like, it's so much easier for people today, you know what I'm saying, to learn how to do this. It is, yeah. I don't even Um, know how I did it with that. Like, looking back, being a trainer, like, how did I overcome that that many obstacles? Yeah, well, (laughs) even we would use our regular reflection boards, and we would use, like, a snap-on shop light, the one with the hook on it that was corded, and we would get two small bungee cords and time to the back of our board and only have one side of our board lit up or we would put it behind our black line or in, in the center and illuminate the whole thing. But, you know, I think you mentioned last episode or the episode before, John, when we had hail damage, a lot of the times we would just use the natural reflection in, in, the, in the shop that we were working on. We would use the overhead right. uh, fluorescent lights. And there was moments where people would come in and be like, hey, what are you looking at? How can you even see what you're doing? It's like, there's reflections right there, you know? <laughs> right, right. That That's insane. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, the funny thing is, I, here's here was my upgrade, guys, to a fog, finally, was actually a piece of, um, uh, like, a styrofoam board. And what you would do is you would take it, it was kind of had, like, styrofoam in the middle, and it had white in the front and white in the back. Well, you'd cut one side where you could snap it open, like, into a V, right? And then I, I actually still have this on my old light. I, you just put your bulb in front of it, and now you got a V styrofoam board coming out around your bulb, and that was my first fog, and that's currently what I have back in my other shop. That's fine. Wow. Still have yeah. that dinosaur. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> de- definitely lights change, changed a lot. Well, not that only was... that, you know, not only that, Vince, the fatigue of your eyes from the fluorescent uh, yeah. lights compared to today. You want to talk about money-making? Well, just being able to push dents day after day without having the type of eye fatigue we had. Now, look, I remember back in hailstorms, you know, prior to like, you know, 2005, 2006, when I was going to my very first hailstorms and I was working all day looking at a fluorescent bulb. And I could remember me and many of the technicians there, that some of them are great technicians, getting burnt out to the point to where we couldn't even see the tip of our tool. Like, yeah, your eyes start watering. <laughs> yeah, and next thing you know, they get really droopy, and I cannot remember the last time I ever experienced a burnout because of LED lights. Yeah. Well, back back in 1995, I came out with the first portable light, and I don't know if you guys remember those old uh, yellow light fixtures that they used to sell in Home Depot that had little floodlights for doing constructions. And it was a little yellow tripod and would fold up. And I sourced those out and I found the manufacturer and I was buying them straight from the manufacturer without the lights on them. And then I attached 
um, I found a little two foot fixture with a cover on it. And I painted the inside with the black stripe. And that was the very first portable light with fog. And um, I don't think anybody else had anything like that back then. Inventure was making some pretty good lights, um, but they're all big, but not portable. Hey, all you Dent Trainer members out there. I wanted to let you guys in on something that's happening that's going to be quite amazing in the month of August. Uh, August the 10th, on a Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we are going to be having a live webinar with Tom Ziegler of the Zig Ziegler Organization. Tom currently sits as the CEO of Zig Ziegler, and he is the son of the late great legend Zig Ziglar. So we're actually going to have him on here and this is huge. So I encourage all of you guys out there to put this in your calendar and if you're not a Dent Trainer member, right now there's never been a better time. We always have something going on over there, whether it's a sale for a monthly, quarterly, yearly, or a six month subscription. Sign up before August the 10th and you'll be able to be a part of this live webinar. So we look forward to seeing you there. Now back to the show. So essentially, now, I, I would say after the lights, I mean, we got to say that the next level and the next step, I would imagine, in progression would probably be glue pulling and then blending hammers. Yeah. Glue pulling. You well, know, glue pulling was prior the, to, the, to the LEDs, but, you know, it was right around the same time that it got popular. Yeah. Yeah. Um, glue pulling was a little bit before, I think, I think but... Um, I remember, I remember the worth guy coming in to my shop and showing me this thing. Actually, I, I'll back up. There was, uh, somebody in Japan came out with these glue tabs and they were like little triangles and they had a hole in the middle and you'd melt the end of it onto the dent and you'd pull from the center of it. And then you'd rotate it and use the other other star. I never got it. I had some of them, but I never could get them to work. I never had any instructions how they worked. I don't even know how I got a hold of them. But um, that was like the very first glue pulling thing I heard. And then the Worth guy came in and they showed me the Worth glue pulling system. And I remember buying that thing and... I honestly didn't, I didn't grab onto it right away. I mean, I, I barely used that thing. Right. Right. Yeah. I was, I, I liked it. The worth. Yeah. Yeah, I did. It, well, there was nothing else out at that time. I never, I was really doubting it. It took know? me a long time to buy into the mini lifter. Like I seen the worth when it first came out and I used it with my buddy and all this. And I'm like, man, this thing cannot. I'm just using, I was slide hammer all the way up until literally like three years ago. I used nothing but a slide hammer. And um, I probably wouldn't go back and change a thing because I can now just interchange between the slide hammer and the mini lifter. And I love my slide, but I like the mini lifter now. And uh, my first mini lifter was actually a Dent Gear uh, mini lifter. And I actually still have it today. But since then, I've actually went with that Kecko which I think uh, is another uh, great time-saving little lifter, man. That Kecko, it looks stupid as can be. It looks like a freaking dumb-looking little robot that stands on your cart, <laughs> but literally it is, it's legit. I, I personally think that's the best mini lifter out there. The Kecko? Yeah. The, yeah. The, with the pass-through? Yeah. The, the feet are the big thing, because and the, the rotating head. You know, being able oh, yeah. to rotate that head when you get up to, uh, you know, up by the corner of a door and you got the mirror in the way and you got, you got other obstacles in the way and you can turn the head, um, it makes a big difference. So that's um, a money maker, baby. <laughs> and, those, and, the, and the feet pivot. Those right. Feet, feet pivot and they never leave a mark. I have I've never. Pulled. And my other mini lifters, I've left dents from other mini lifter feet and the, the only mini lifter i've ever owned and I, I still use daily not daily but pretty close to it is the dent gear lifter yeah uh, and i hear that one's one of the better ones 
I know Tom Price always talks about that one and he loves that one. Yeah. When it first came out, I got it and I've never really found a need to get any other ones, but I do, you know, drool a little bit over the, the Keiko. Lifter. Yeah. You have to get yeah. it. Yeah. That honestly, and, and the new one, you want the new one that's lightweight. Um, cause I have one of the metal ones and I don't even use that one anymore. Um, I've got, actually, I think I got two of those and I don't even use them cause I, I go for that light one because it doesn't fall over when you set it up on a car and stuff and it just feels good in your hand. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, here's the thing. Like I, I just, uh, Keith Constantino actually sent me that one. So he basically, okay. Cosentino. All right. So yeah, he, he actually sent me that one in exchange. I made a little video for him. So, but, uh, I, you know, I'm like Vinny, you know, I'm like, man, I really like my dent gear one. I'm never going to change. And that one is in my hand first. I don't even know where the dent gear one's at now. I mean, I like the dent gear one. Don't get me wrong, but like, uh, Daniel's saying that thing never mars the paint and it's like, safer <laughs> you know what i'm saying yeah. and just yeah. more convenient because of that pivoting yeah, but head the, the thing is is if you've got a, a really bad transition that thing will get into places where the other ones will not oh dude daniel it'll glue pull moldings i don't know i mean you know that i do that i came out with a video teaching people how to glue pull little chrome moldings to fix them oh, well right. that's the only one that sometimes you can get in that little corner edge that you got to get down on yeah. for like a rear quarter glass and I'm going to tell you guys something. You guys might laugh about glue pulling moldings, but we have made so much money doing that. And on top of it, Cole Fox had reported once I started coming out with videos about it, that he made over, I want to say $20,000 in one year glue pulling moldings. Really? Yeah. Wow. With, hail, hail, with hail damage. Yeah, man. You know, a, wow. do you guys realize what a rear quarter glass molding cost? No. A lot of times they're around five. They can be around 350 bucks all the way to 750 and Holy then shit. you got to pay a glass company to come out, pull the glass, put the molding on, and put the glass back in. Or in some cases, like the one that I have in here, the Lexus, the glass actually comes with the molding. So it's a glass replacement. Wow. Yeah, I want to say, cute. yeah, the last one that I, the, <laughs> another one that we had, and think about it, two per car. Two of them bad yeah. boys per car on a whoop tail car. I mean, you're not going to fix the really bad ones. But I in here, I have actually talked insurance companies into allowing me to do it for the part price. So if, if wow. I can fix this for the part price, I won't charge you guys no glass cost, but if I can fix it for the part price, will, will you do that? And they'll say, sure. You know? Wow. Now, does it work? Like, I, I just did an estimate yesterday on a hail car, and there was a dent in the molding, and it, it almost looked like it was covered with plastic, though. Uh, yeah, they do have rubber was, coatings on them. Some some yeah. of them are rubber coated. Well, let me, it's not. It didn't it didn't seem like it was rubber coated. It seemed like it was more plastic, like vinyl. Yeah, yeah. And I wasn't sure. I, I didn't know. You know, does it work on that? Well, normally the chrome ones are what you're looking for. You can try. Mm -hmm. I have done it on the plastic rubber coated ones that are on roofs. You know, for instance, like the the yeah, ones that are in this which, was. Yeah, yeah. I've done that before on them. And been okay. able to pull it like the whole thing kind of lifts up, so you got to pin it down with your mini lifter. Um, if you do it with a slide hammer, you can bend it, break it, rip it off, you know, things like that. So you got to be kind of slick with the slide hammer. You want to check out the video? Go to denttrainer.com and check it out. Uh, you know, I have a whole video about it. When we're sitting here talking about money makers, so this is a money maker, okay, guys. And on top of that, I'm gonna tell you guys a little other secret. I've got some techniques where the moldings are really blendable. I'm here to tell you that you could take almost um, uh, a dent that's the size of, uh, let's say, half a dime. That's usually the size of the ones that come on the moldings. And you can hit around it with a soft tip, and you can actually push it and blend it out. I mean, but you got to be very careful, though. It, they're, they're really easy to dent them little aluminum moldings. And if you do it with a sharp tip, you are going to leave little divots. Okay. Good to know. Yep, so... I think that actually... And you show what tip you, you're using as your knockdown and all I that? I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah, through the Dent yeah. Trainer video. So um, so that actually leads us on to what would be next that we were just uh, discussing is blending. So I want to say that blending is one of the things that became a huge moneymaker. And where I first experienced blending wasn't in your traditional what we're doing today where you're doing rails and stuff like that. Where I experienced blending was the old Dent Craft hammers. They had three different lengths 
and you put a tip on them. And, and when I was finishing large dents to get that last little wave out of there, you'd actually step back and, and you weren't open hand swinging back then. At least the people I knew wasn't doing that. And you were laying the, the knockdown tip from the longest hammer on the high spot or the crown wave that was left in the dent and you were hitting it with the second longest one. Or vice versa, you were doing the short one and the next long one. And that's how we were blending out the large round dents. So what what, what was your guys' first experience with the but, blending hammers? You know, it's funny. I, I can remember the exact time and place that I blended out a complete dent. I was working at a, a car wash, and I had a Jeep Grand Cherokee. It had a dent up by the, the, the glass right at the top of the panel in the back quarter panel. And I worked worked really hard trying to get to the dent and i had probably a good 45 minutes trying to get to the dent and i couldn't get to it there was a brace in the way there was no way for me to get it out and i was too invested in the dent and i was like god damn it and and it was really shallow it was just really shallow and so i started blending this thing and i ended up blending that dent out uh without pushing from the backside. Right. And you know, this was before glue pulling too. I didn't have any glue and I just blended that thing. And I remember saying to myself, I wonder if anybody else knows how to do this. Right. So how about you, Vinny? Okay. So we can't hear you, Vince. I don't know what it is. I think you, he, uh, he put you, his mute on. You, I, I muted. On his, <laughs> I was sucking on his, uh, pacifier. Right. I think you were trying yeah. to talk earlier, but we weren't getting any of it, man. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry so guys. what, what, where, where are you at? Cause I seen you making facial expressions, but I just couldn't, uh, uh yeah, well, <laughs> I, I, I've been blending since probably 98. Yeah. When I did, that I could recall, uh, whether, you know, I haven't mentioned it in quite a few episodes, but it's been my craftsman hammer has always been my blending hammer. Uh, right. What was that again? My craftsman hammer. Now, the besides craftsman that, hammer, the money maker. Yeah. Uh, Tell us about that craftsman hammer. Well, listen, there's there's two craftsman hammers that we used to use. And back, I when I first moved to California, I had Hertz and Budget at LEX was uh, my account, and uh, Hertz was forty thousand cars and Budget was thirty thousand cars, and every single one had to cross our paths at one point when they went turning them back in. Now we had. This is back back when the Lakers were rocking it, you know, and uh, the, <laughs> we would get these cars back after the Lakers had won, you know, uh, championship, and people were bouncing all over, you know, cars all over the place, you know, jumping all over cars and caving in roofs and hoods and whatnot, and we discovered we could blend out Lincoln Town car roofs without ever dropping the the headliners. And we're talking huge caved in dents. And the way we did it was we had a craftsman soft faced hammer, the one that comes with four different tips. There's a red tip, yellow tip, brown tip, and a metal tip. The only two tips that we used was the brown and the red. Uh, both were soft. Brown was really soft. And all we would do is just do all this crown work, blending out the crowns on the roof of the car. And back then, those town cars didn't have any bracing on the inside. And the headliners were heavily glued into the car. So we would literally make these roofs 95 to 100% just by blending from the outside and never sticking a tool on the inside of the car. And once in a while, we would drop like a, a you know, a, 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 what are those, a sissy handle, whatever, you, you know, and, and stick a, a Johnson up there and, and work out something that was a little bit tougher. But we we would blend the crap out of things just yeah. using the hammers, and we would never have to drop headliners and do so. I I would do the same thing, and I I don't know if you guys ever did this. I made a I had a wooden ball that I put a nail through, and I would poke it through the headliner so I wouldn't have to take the headliner down. Yeah, and I'd work a dent out, and then I would I would fuzz the the headliner back over the hole that I poked through the headliner. Did you <laughs> yeah. ever do that? <laughs> I, yeah, we did. You know what? And oddly enough, I, I used to do it on Ferraris too. Oh, uh, ouch. <laughs> the, the, with the, the leather headliner, there was a couple years ago. Well, then, that, didn't they have little holes, perforations in they, them? They did, yeah. They yeah. Leather with with uh, perforations in them. So I would take a small little pick, a little snap-on pick that you would use to... yeah. 
and I would push the gen out right through the headliner without ever dropping it down. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the idea of blending has always been around and it probably goes back to the, the start of PBR. Well, you, it, it really did. I mean, we used to blend, you, you'd always have to hit down the crown when you were working on little dent. And I was taught that from the very beginning, but, what I think we're talking about is that that next evolution of where you're doing a lot of blending on bigger dents, the bigger crowns, the, um, the nuances of blending. Um, well, not, not only, first... not only that, just rolling through a rail and being able to knock rail damage out so much quicker than, than what you could normally and that's sure. one of the things that I want to tell you guys about because I'm going to be coming out with a tutorial here soon for all of you tactical buyers and all the Dent Trainer members that it's going to be a new wave of blending. And it's going to have a lot to do with that kick that the tactical has into it coming down on the rail and exactly how to use that so any a novice blender can essentially learn these techniques and become a great blender. Yeah, and you know, the, the first hammers that I bought besides Craftsman were... Uh... Those were issued to me, but were the tomahawks, the the dent craft tomahawk ha hammers, were, right? That's you know, and those I thought those were great, and I still use them every once in a while on the long reach where I use both of them at the same time. Use one to uh, center over the the crown or the knockdown, and using the other one to tap on top of it. Uh, I think that it, that's kind of obsolete now. Now with the other blending hammers that are out there, you could just do it, especially the tactical and. Uh, you know, the first blending hammer I ever bought would be the dent craft mm -hmm. hammers. And then I evolved into a Drew's tools one, which I didn't like very much at all. In fact, I gave it away. And l let me ask you guys, you guys just got the new tactical heads and I know you guys were a massive part of the evolution of that thing. What did you think about it when you got the new lighter weight version? All honest opinions compared to yeah. the original. It was definitely a lot more usable, um, for me. Uh, I like my hammers light. I don't, I, I think you end up getting a lot of fatigue on your arm. Now that I'm older, I really, really notice that the fatigue in my arm. And so the lighter is definitely better. And to me, it makes it more usable and it didn't take away anything by lightening it. That's no. the best part of it. it. It didn't take anything away. Um, in fact, I think you improved it. Uh, in other ways, uh, by making the slot hole, uh, bigger. Yeah. So you can stick other tools to it. Um, I'm dying to get, I'm starting to get some hail cars from Denver rolling in. I had one, right. A couple estimates the last couple of days. So I'm excited as hell to get a rail that I can really go to town on that thing. Yeah. Right. I got one coming in from Denver too. Uh, hopefully in this next week here. And, uh, same thing it, it, just to reiterate with what daniel just said it, it's it's nicer it because it's lighter on my forearms it's less fatigue on my forearms while right. i'm sitting there nothing away so it really did make a big difference lightening it up uh the, your your beta version of what you sent me will still be used but it's probably going to be used more for leverages leverage yeah. positions rather than uh using it for for hammering in fact i've already set that one the older one up as as a leverage tool it's my dedicated leverage tool I, I honestly i could probably buy about five of those things and and set them up for <laughs> right two, and john i think i think you should just sell you know the brass knuckle part of it uh yeah currently i'm trying to work out how i'm going to structure that and do that because i got to keep inventory and stock flowing and i don't want anybody to get away from you know at the initial thing i don't want anybody to get away from the blending experience with it because, yeah, sure. you know, the thing is, as a hammer, it, people don't realize it is a, I, I, maybe I'm biased, but I have people that come in here all the time and I get feedback from people. People are telling me that they just love it and it's making them a better blender and it's a badass hammer. Like, oh, I, yeah. I, I think there's some people out there that think that I put it out just for the cool factor and the looks. But when they get their hands on it and feel the functionality of the tool, I have not had one person, one complaint about this tool. Now, when you did that, you know, lo looking like brass knuckles, did you do that on purpose to make it look bad? Well, or was there? Yeah, essentially I did it because it's a hand rig. So right. what, what else? I mean, how else am I going to design it to be tight to your hands to be a hand rig? 
<laughs> you right, know. we've all we've all <laughs> kind of evolved already and put switch switched it around the other way where we're holding the 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 stick portion of it and using that to to blend well yeah as, that's as the head of the hammer well that's exactly how it started so if you look on um if you go to tacticalpdr.com and you watch the video on the front page you actually see that it started as that being the handle the knuckle part and I was actually forming a head that was going to go on top of it and set in there with a set screw. But once I started using the knuckles and turning them at a curve and using it as a blending, I knew hands down that I could use it, but you can flip the tool at any way that you want to use it. And you can use the top as a blender or you can use the bottom as a blender. So that was kind of the idea behind that. Yeah, no, it's great. It's great because it's so versatile. Yeah, so, I can see someday in the future some some uh, young whippersnappers doing a podcast about tools and talking how this was a game changer, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, a lot of people's so, bought it, and I'm getting a great a lot of feedback. So, um, and I'm gonna be good. dropping I'm gonna be dropping special editions. The next special edition that's coming out, I don't know which one's gonna come first, but one of them's going to be uh, a total blackout edition that's gonna be done with carbon. And then one of the next ones is going to be, you guys are going to have to wait to see what it looks like, but it's going to be the zombie killer. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, and, then, I, and then for Mother's Day, you can do a pink one. And, and one with bling all over it, too, with uh, Swarovski crystals encrusted right. all over it. <laughs> so now, uh, now getting, getting back on to the flow of the show, you know, so essentially we got lights, we got blending hammers. Now we're getting close to, uh, you know, getting towards the end. So I want to talk about... Um, probably one of the biggest game changers that I've seen this year that I thought was totally ridiculous when I first seen it was by far Cola Fria. Yes. Uh, I mean, there's nothing that, and not to mention my, my students, like my students have to have it when they come here. I mean, they're like, wow, I couldn't even imagine what you guys, like they're looking at it like today is like, I can't imagine when you guys were glue pulling these dents and overextending the crap out of them in certain spots and having to do all this knockdown work to release the high spot. When you had this stuff to move it out fluently, do the crown work and fix the little dents that are left. Right. Yeah. I, I think you're right about that. Cola free is awesome. I mean, I've been rolling through, I don't know about you guys, but man, I've been rolling through big dents ridiculously fast. I mean, that's just, uh, like I think we talked about in the show before. I mean, you know, big dents are coming in that would normally take three hours, and I'm rolling through them in like 45 minutes because I unlock the whole thing with Cola Fria, do the crown work, fix the little dents, and it's done. Yeah. You know, I used it today. I had a, a Dodge Ram truck that had a soft dent on the rear bumper, chrome bumper, and uh, there was about 40 other dents on, on the truck, and I fixed them all. And, and initially, he's like, hey, could you fix that bumper? I'm like, no, dude, the metal's too thick. The metal's too thick. And uh, then I remembered that I watched uh, one of the guys from uh, South America put a video up on YouTube, or not on YouTube, but on uh, Facebook a couple, two, three weeks ago, pulling out a soft dent on a bumper, a chrome bumper. I'm like, ah, screw it. I'm going to try it. So I said, hey, listen, I'm either going to be a hero or a zero right now. Right. He's like, Why? What are you going to do? It's like, I'm going to try something I haven't tried before. And I pulled out the Cola Fria to do it on the chrome bumper, the rear bumper. And it was a soft dent. And I wish I friggin' videoed it because I got, I got 90% of the damn thing out just on wow. one pull. On what kind of bumper? On a Dodge bumper. <laughs> are you kidding me? No, I'm not. There I'm was not. a video. I thought that was a far stretch, but if it. On a soft dent with the right snap with a, a good heavy slide hammer, you're gonna you're gonna pull some of it out. And I was thinking, oh, the there, there would be some uh, distortion in the chrome by being you know flexed so hard or or something you know impact and just the movement of chrome it, it doesn't move like paint. <laughs> and it, it pulled ninety percent of it out. I said, there, boom. There's your tip. No. Charge. Have, you, have you guys ever seen? Do you guys have a bumper man around where you guys are? Have you ever seen those guys work? I we haven't. used to have one guy. I wasn't impressed at all. All it made was, you know, tiny little marks in the chrome. I was not impressed. Uh, the guy, the guy in my area, his name's Merlin. I love his name, man. Merlin. Uh, <laughs> Merlin, the bumper man. And he's, he's 94 back. years old. He's he's an old redneck man, and he's funny. He's uh, he's real stocky, but just he, he reminds me of somebody from uh, the south. And um, he does a damn good job. I'm actually really impressed. And that the other day, uh, well, not the other day, about a year ago, 
I go, you know, you'd be a lot better off if you used a reflector board. He goes, what do you mean? And I, I showed him, uh, I had Mike Toledo's reflector board and I set it up and I go, see? And he goes, oh, wow, I can see a lot better. And I go, yeah. And so I go, here, you can have this one. And so I gave him the reflector board. The last time he came by, he was like, wow, that reflector board makes a big difference, man. Well, that's one way of getting rid of line boards that you yeah. have in your inventory that you never use, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Michael right. would like to hear that one. All right. So, hey, guys, uh, we are going to be heading towards our main tool and our tech tip, but we're going to get back with you right after this commercial break. It's right smack hail season now, and what better timing than to have a hail damage video explaining the short and engaging repair process. At Den Trainer, we just released a new video about the steps a consumer needs to do after the vehicle has been hit with hail. It's called It Hailed, What's Next? A professional video with your company logo and information. For more details and cost, please visit dentrainer.com slash store. All right, guys. So on top of that there, I want you all to v uh, visit pdrtooltime.com backslash store and get Vinny back in business. He's got some t-shirts to sell. How many of them bad boys we got still, Vinny? You know what? We got about 30 left in inventory, large and extra large only. Right. And uh, when those are gone, they're gone for good. And what, what we want, guys, is we want you to take pictures of you wearing your PDR tool time in exotic places and uh, send them to us, email those to us, and uh, we'll put them up on the site. Yeah, yeah. And when, uh, when, when he, uh, Daniel says exotic places, he's talking about strip bars and stuff like that, right? Uh, Ho Hooters. Strip clubs, Hooters. Yeah. If El you, Hooters. Yeah, if you can go to Hooters and do a wet t-shirt contest with our t-shirts, uh, I'll, I'll send you a magical tool. I'll send you something special. <laughs> yeah, likewise. I'll send you. I'll send if that if that happens. I send out a tactical to you. But we want we want full video, <laughs> no pictures, video, full video. Oh that. man! So yeah. guys, we're getting down to the grind. So we actually talked about a lot of money making tools here and how it's evolved and um, how it's helped us out quite a bit. Well, I I think we need to talk to one one more okay big thing and. That was, is the internet. The internet was uh, the biggest game changer, I think, and social media and networking. And that right there, I think, was a huge game changer for our industry. Networking guys and guys sharing information. You wouldn't have Dent Trainer. Uh, we wouldn't have this podcast. Um, that was... I think the biggest thing um, in our industry. Right. Wasn't it Al Gore that made the internet? Yeah, he did. <laughs> in his basement. I think he actually <laughs> said that, but. <laughs> Lamo. <laughs> well, he, he was an influential in making what it is that we know it today. But I remember being on yeah. dial up on 400 baud mode. Right. Talking, you know, talking to people around the world on a, a black and green screen. Yeah, I thought that was the coolest thing ever. You know, my buddy, yeah. he used to do the first uh, part of online dating. He was a uh, man. He was out there. He was getting chicks everywhere that he went. He was finding any cutting edge way he could get a hold of them. And you know where he actually started tapping into that? The first part of online dating came through for him was where? freaking AOL chat rooms. You guys remember them? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah well, I would hook up on AOL chat rooms. <laughs> yeah, that dude was like putting like starting chat rooms and like any girls available on this area, that's hot. And yeah. uh, man, it was working for him, you know? That's what dude, we thought about at that age. Well, Johnny, I don't know. You're not that much younger than me, but uh, there was party lines before the <laughs> internet and AOL chat rooms. You would call a number and, and talk to like 20 different people in your area and try and hook up. Where, where's the party? You know, who's, you know, who's, who's down? DTF. That was DTF. So now are we going to go ahead and start our tech tip session and our biggest money making tools are about to come out right now. Who wants to kick this off? I'll kick it off really quick. Biggest money making tools is. Dan craft hammer. Craftsman hammer. My truck. 
<laughs> my lettered vehicle. Really? Yes. How? How? I mean, like people calling you like every day on it, like like Yelp or something. Uh, yeah. People, people. If you don't have lettering on your truck, something, I, I think you're doing yourself a big disservice. You know, you have to, yeah. you have to be out there and in, in the community. And and people, they might not call you right away, but being loud and proud with your your name on your vehicle, and not, I'm not talking magnets on the side of your car. I'm talking a, a proper lettering on your card. Let's see, yeah. let's everyone know in your community who you are, and and uh, when they do need you, they'll remember you. I get people thinking that we're like this huge franchise. We only have two vehicles driving around town with our names on it. Oh yeah, I saw you two weeks ago at this parking lot here. Oh, I saw you there. You know, I didn't need you then, but I need you now, and I remembered your name. Yeah. Or this, this, and that. You know, uh, for quite a few years, I had a huge QR code on the back of my my truck. No one really uses QR codes anymore, but I would be stopping at a stoplight, and I would see people taking pictures of the the rear of my QR code while they're driving behind me. I'd be looking in my rearview mirror and seeing you know them snapping pictures of it, getting the information. And not only that, but it was helping uh, you know bring people to the website, which in return boosts your your organic. Uh, ratings on Google and things like that. The more right. organic people come to your website. Right. So and the vehicle and, is very important with lettering. Right. And nowadays people are getting away from the wraps and uh, keeping it plain and simple. Like Vinny's been doing since day one, still rocks his khakis with a cuff and a crease, you know, that's yes. the way Vinny does it. Right. And yeah, I do. And John, you mentioned it, what, uh, two times ago, the, the average uh, light or uh, attention span is what, eight to nine seconds now. So yeah, it's like eight seconds, eight seconds. So if you cram a whole bunch of crap all over your vehicle, you know, about everything you do, chances are they're not going to remember anything you do. So a simple company name, a quick blah, 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 paintless dent removal and a phone number or a website. That way there's recognition and later on they'll remember you. Right. Yeah. If good. you look at most of those vehicles, that the wraps, you can't even, you can't read it from, you know, three car lengths away. Yeah. I got yeah. one that I'm totally embarrassed about because it's, it's just like that. And some lady actually hit my van. It's on my van. Uh, and it looks really cool. It's like, you know, the old style it's got, it's actually got Mike on it. So I had Mike do the artwork for it. And, uh, you know, but she, some lady hit my van with a U-Haul truck from next door and she thought it was, she called him and told him that she hit the flower van. <laughs> <laughs> she like that's what they left on their answer machine they were like come over here and listen to this and they're like this lady's like i hit your flower van on the way out of the parking lot <laughs> and, uh, that's funny and, you know and mike mike always had big stuff on his xbox and stuff like that and a picture of himself fixing a dent on his xbox which was cool and everything but it's just evolved now we're simple elegant to the point boom boom get that attention get a, a little uh, memory of your company later on. And, and when they need you, they're going to call you. Right, right. So, all right, Daniel. So that's our tech, our, our tech tip, our money making tech tip there. So Daniel, what's and, yours? And the craftsman hammer. And the craftsman <laughs> hammer. Go ahead, Daniel. Uh, mine, my biggest money making tool is the mobile tech expo. That, th that place has made me, because that's where I go to discover tools uh get my hands on it there's so many tools there that i've bought at the show that i would have never bought through a catalog online because you have to have it in your hands and see how it works and and you you won't get it otherwise and being at the show and networking with all the guys i i wouldn't be friends with you guys if I didn't go to Mobile Tech Expo. This wouldn't be happening right now. Um, so the Mobile Tech Expo is, is so much more than just going there for tools. It's networking. You're going to uh, make me cry, Daniel. I'm going to cry. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and not to mention how much fun it is. I yes. mean, I look forward to that thing every year. I have a blast with you guys. And, um, just it, I, you know, you learn about the software to, to do estimates. You learn about, uh, you know, what other guys are charging. And when you hear other guys saying like Paul Corden saying he's getting $1,200 for a panel, you're like what shit, 
maybe I need to try to do that. Yeah, you know, and we wouldn't have even had this podcast if it wasn't for MTE because of our our late night tool reviews in our bathroom. Yeah, that's where this thing was born. You know, it was drunken born. drunken tool reviews at yeah. four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> right. Yeah, it was born from that. So, uh, yeah, I I can't say enough. If you guys have not, if you're listening to this right now and you have not been to Mobile Tech Expo, drop whatever you're doing, get on the internet get your reservations, decide to go now Why you have the money and it makes it much easier when it rolls around. Right, right, right. There you go. That's a good one, man, because that's got to be one of my money makers too, for sure. So um, just so many different angles there that you can go with. You can also sell your products, services, things like that. You come up with something cool, uh, you can bring it there and get massive. You can win the Dent Olympics and use that as a marketing tool. Massive exposure in, in any aspect of anything you can do there. So uh, you're right. right. That's an incredible money maker. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys what my money maker is. And it's been one of the biggest money makers that I have ever. And in fact, this probably contributes to millions of dollars for the bottom line of my companies, you know, doing hail damage and, uh, you know, setting up big storms, you know, when we got hit in 2011, 100,000 claims, I ran about 30 guys uh, that year. And the biggest money maker was by far the pen. And I made more money pushing paper and pushing supplements over to insurance companies than I did pushing dents. And that's something that I want a lot of you guys to sink in a lot of you route guys that are out there. I used to be the guy that would drive around and I didn't know about supplements. Man, I didn't know that you could contact the insurance company and get them to pay you what you're supposed to be paid on these vehicles. I was literally showing up and if it was written for $1,400, $2,000, I was doing the car for that amount and leaving so much money on the table. So the the key to making, and I'm telling you, like I could probably look back and in 2011 alone, there was millions of dollars of supplements that w was done during that storm. And that was all me learning how to push paper with a pen rather than pushing dents. And today, you don't even got to do it with a pen. You can actually do it on an app like Mobile Tech RX. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Now, that's a good one, John. That's good. They, uh, now, do you have a video on that subject? I do. I do actually. Yeah. If you go over to denttrainer.com, we get a full scale uh, tutorial. Uh, in fact, not a tutorial. It's like a certification where you actually take a test, but it's um, over, I, I want to say about an hour and a half of video of me going through three different estimates. One of them would be a basic and then an intermediate and then an advanced uh, hail damage estimate. And I go over all kinds of techs and technique, or tips and techniques on how to write supplements, how to get in contact with the right person with the insurance company, and exactly how to go about all of that at denttrainer.com. And I was told by an individual last year at the Mobile Tech Expo that in one year, by himself, that video series added $60,000 to his bottom line. What? Yeah, he was like me, man. He was rolling around and doing it for the estimate. And you know what? Nah, you need to look. If you're just winging it with hail damage estimates and you've never hung around a hail tech that can write an estimate, you need to get on denttrainer.com if it's the last thing you do and go through that course. Because I'm here to tell you if you think your membership is expensive for, I think we're running a deal now for 300 bucks for the year, it's going to be way more expensive if you do not watch this tutorial and learn how to write a proper hail estimate. Not to mention, you're making us all look bad. <laughs> I'm going to say it. Yeah, you know? you'll raise the industry by watching the video. Yeah, if you're out there and you're writing sloppy estimates and you're the reason why an insurance adjuster comes in and looks at a rail that I wrote for $1,000 and he says some guy down the street's writing it for 300 or 200 if you're that guy, you're not helping the industry out. In fact, you're doing yourself an injustice because you're not you're leaving money on the table hey guys look if you guys haven't checked out dent trainer there's i can't believe john how much information you guys have on there i still haven't seen everything on there and i go on there all the time and you're constantly putting new information out there and that is such a great resource just the business section um is worth the membership alone not 
not even mentioning all the other stuff, but you got such good information on that. I appreciate that, Daniel. I appreciate that, man. And I know you truly mean it, and you're not just doing that because you're my buddy. I mean, you're on there, and you tell me things about it. But uh, yeah. something I want, before I forget, and I, I want to tell people this, okay, it's it's getting bad in the insurance industry as far as them sending checks directly to the company who's doing the repair work. So another thing that I'm doing with my pen is you want to have customers fill out a direction to pay or sign a direction to pay. Essentially, that uh, allows you to fax that to the insurance company, and it's the customer giving you the rerouting the payment to you rather than to them. It's the one thing that'll save your butt if the insurance company accidentally sends the customer the check and you're a little worried about them coming through. Why even mess with it? Have them sign a direction to pay, especially if they're if they're taking that car before you get paid. They're leaving your shop or your location before you're paid on it. A direction to pay needs to be signed. And, and, you, I, and you have that on Dent Trainer? Well, that's what I was going to tell you, Daniel. That's one thing that I'm putting on Dent Trainer and I'm working on it right now. Um, it'll be one of them things that you can download the one that I use and you can take it to your Perfect. attorney and have him look at it for your local state laws, um, and make sure that it's in coordinates with all that, but you can use the one that, that I use and I'm working on getting that over into the business section. That's awesome, dude. That's oh, huge. I pr- yep. 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 So anyhow, we're going to go ahead and end this podcast. We'll check you guys later. I appreciate, uh, Appreciate it. it. was a good time. Hopefully you guys can take away uh, with some of this stuff and turn these tools into money makers for you. Yeah, and we should have uh, Mike on uh, the next episode. Yes. Uh, we'll probably have to give him a, another week to recover. <laughs> yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll try to roll him into his chair somehow. And yeah. just, you guys <laughs> need to tune into our next episode because it, it will be all four of us and we will be going over motorcycle PDR. Yeah, boy. Yeah. All right, guys. All right, guys. Shake your money maker like somebody bought to pay you. I see you on my radar. Don't you act like you were afraid of shit. You know I got it. If you want to come get it, stand next to this money like, hey, hey, hey. All right, everybody. You heard that. Shake your money maker. Now, if you're looking for a real money maker, head on over to tacticalpdr.com and check out the all-new Tactical Hammer this thing literally turns into from a blending hammer one of the best blending hammers with a unique kick that um really makes blending much easier and you can also use it as a leverage device you can use it as a pushing device now if that ain't money i don't know what is head on over to tacticalpdr.com